Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and thank you for your support on Patreon. We appreciate you. A lot is happening in the space industry right now. SpaceX has test-fired its Super Heavy booster, with 31 of 33 engines working properly. One was shut off by SpaceX prior to ignition, and the other shut itself down when it started to malfunction. This is most likely a survivable scenario for first launch, depending on which engines go out and when. An engine out on one side requires rapid adjustment of the remaining engines. This was a problem for the only other rocket launched with this many engines. Here we see the Soviet N-1. The N-1 had 30 NK-15 engines. These burned RP-1 and liquid oxygen in a staged combustion engine producing 1.75 meganewtons of thrust maximum. A little math tells us that the first stage could produce about 52 meganewtons on takeoff. But since rockets are throttled back from 100%, the actual launch thrust was about 45 meganewtons. The open cycle RP-1 fueled F-1 engines on the Saturn V produced 6.77 meganewtons at sea level. With five of these engines, that gave the Saturn V a thrust of a little less than 34 meganewtons. The Starship is, of course, using methane and liquid oxygen in a full-flow stage combustion Raptor engine producing up to 2.3 meganewtons of thrust. With 33 engines, that comes out to 69 meganewtons total, making the SpaceX Starship the most powerful rocket system ever built. But how hard will it be for SpaceX to deal with these engine problems in flight? The only parallel we have is the Soviet N-1 moon rocket. The N-1 was built to help the Soviet Union beat the Americans to the moon. Here you can see it compared to other large rocket systems including Starship. And here you can see it compared to just the Saturn V. The Soviets had won every other milestone in the space race and were confident they could achieve the grand prize. If Werner von Braun was the father of the Apollo Saturn V, then Sergei Korolev was the father of the Soviet N-1. The N-1 had six engines in the center and 24 in an outer ring. The N-1's fatal flaw, however, turned out to be controlling all of those engines. The engine control system was called CORD, which stood for, literally, control of rocket engines. The N-1 rocket had been built and tested at one quarter scale as a proof of concept before actual production started. Serial number N-1-1L was a dynamic test model, where each of the full-size components was built and tested separately. Serial number N-1-2L was a full-scale training vehicle. N-1-3L was the first to be launched on 21 February 1969. This rocket roared off the launch pad with no problem, but just two seconds into the first flight, Cord shut down engine number 12 due to a voltage spike. To maintain symmetrical thrust, Cord also shut down engine number 24. Six seconds after launch, engine number 2 started to pogo. A pogo oscillation is where the engine starts to develop combustion instabilities, which goes on to create oscillating thrust. This works like a hammer on the engine mounts. Engine number two tore itself partially free of its mounts and caused a propellant leak. At T plus 25 seconds, further vibrations from engine two tore through a fuel line, and propellant began running down the bottom of the booster. A fire started which burned through wiring in the power supply, creating a short that sent a turbo pump overpressurization warning for all engines to cord. This caused the cord system to shut down all of the engines on the first stage 68 seconds after launch, and to lock out the upper stage engines so they could not be fired. 183 seconds later, the first N1 rocket to reach for the moon impacted the Earth instead, 52 kilometers from the launch pad. The launch escape system did, however, activate properly, sending the empty test spacecraft to safety. Serial number N14L 
developed tank cracks during construction and was scrapped. Soviet moon rocket N1 serial number 5L was the next to launch on 3 July 1969. N1 5L was meant to orbit the moon and photograph possible landing sites for future missions. 5L launched, but just a few seconds into flight there was a flash, and debris could be seen flying from under the rocket. You know what I'm going to say. It was a turbo pump. It's always a turbo pump. The explosion had taken out enough engines to cause the ship to tilt 45 degrees and fall back to the launch pad. The resulting explosion from the 2,300 tons of propellant threw debris over 10 kilometers. The telemetry tapes amazingly survived, and we actually know what happened. Just before takeoff, the liquid oxygen turbo pump and engine number 8 exploded, sending shrapnel out to cut propellant lines and start a fire. Between 10 and 12 seconds after launch, Cord had shut down engines 7, 19, 20, and 21. When an engine goes out, as we said, the engine on the opposite side of the lever arm was shut down also. The N1 could still fly with two pairs of engines shut down by the Cord control system, but not eight. And for some strange reason, engine number 18 continued firing at full power instead of throttling back, causing the ship to tilt those 45 degrees. American spy systems had pictures of the destroyed launch site and knew that the Soviet program was now in trouble. 17 days later, Apollo 11 landed at the Sea of Tranquility, making Neil Armstrong the first and Buzz Aldrin the second human being on the moon. Only ten more would follow. The Soviets did not give up immediately. N1 serial number 6L launched June 26, 1971, but suffered an uncontrolled roll that really hasn't been explained fully, though eddy currents and countercurrents were blamed. The cord system had been modified to prevent a full shutdown right after launch, and the rocket kept climbing. 39 seconds after launch, the rocket was rolling at 40 degrees per second, or about 6.7 RPM. The inertial guidance system could not handle this and went into gimbal lock, meaning it quit trying to guide the ship. N16L tore itself apart 48 seconds after launch. Most of it landed about 15 kilometers away. After this catastrophe, the entire control system was redesigned, with dedicated engines for roll control with an increase in sensors from 700 to 13,000. On November 23rd of 1972, serial number 7L climbed into the sky. Everything went well for a minute and a half. Then the order was given by the control system to shut down the six center engines. This was done to reduce acceleration stress on the vehicle, as the ship had burned most of the propellant in the first stage, and the much lighter rocket was rapidly accelerating. This acceleration created a G-force strain on the rocket. Sadly, the abrupt shutdown of these engines caused a hydraulic shock wave to rebound through the RP-1 and oxygen feed lines, causing these to burst. If these engines had been shut down gradually, everything probably would have been fine. The burst pipes caused large fires and engines started to explode. The nearly empty first stage broke apart at T plus 107 seconds. If the ground control team had sent a separation signal, it is very likely the flight could have been saved at this point. As the flight had been a little less than the 125 seconds of optimal first stage burn time, but close enough to the 110 second minimum for the second stage to have made up the difference. But the signal was not sent, and the rocket fell back to Earth safely ejecting the Soyuz 7K LOK test vehicle on the way. Less than a month later, Eugene Cernan became the last astronaut to leave the moon on 14 December 1972. Another flight of the N1 was planned for August of 1974. Serial number 8L was built and made ready for launch. It would have carried another Soyuz 7L LOK and an LK lunar lander for a lunar flyby and uncrewed landing. This flight was canceled in May of 1974. It would be nice to see some artifacts from the Soviet space program in person. And if you really don't feel like being in Russia right now, you can go here, 
This is the Cosmosphere. And it is the largest repository of Soviet space artifacts outside of the former Soviet Union. And if you live in the United States, you won't even need a passport. Because the Cosmosphere is at the Hall of Space Museum, which is here in Hutchins, Kansas. But if you want to see something even bigger and more powerful than the N1, you will need to go here. This is, of course, Starbase, the SpaceX launch facility in Boca Chica, Texas. It was here on the 9th of February, 2023, that a rocket booster with more power than the N1 Block A was first tested. The SpaceX Starship is much larger and more powerful than the N1. Elon Musk said that in a non-reusable mode, it could get up to 250,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. That would be more than twice the capability of the Saturn V, which, with its hydrogen-powered second and third stages, was more efficient than the Soviet N1. But when you test something this big, something can go wrong. It turns out that, on the second launch of the N1, when serial number 5 on the 3rd of July 1969 fell back 12 seconds after launch and exploded on the launch pad. Only about 15% of the 2,300 tons of propellant detonated, with the rest just burning away. But that was enough to cause complete destruction of the launch facility, which required the Soviets 18 months to repair. The SpaceX Starship will be carrying about 4,600 metric tons of propellant. A similar launch failure of the Starship would be catastrophic and a near full detonation would be unbelievably destructive. I would love to see the first launch of a starship, but perhaps from a good distance. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and stay safe at Astro Proterra.